Hope you are all well, witches. Before we kick off with our book review today, I just wanted to apologise for this episode being a couple of days late. Things have been really intense here. I found a house. I'm waiting to hear back on it. It's out in the countryside. I'm away next week going to Lincoln, where I'm moving to, to sort out lots of bits for me and my daughter. I did research a whole episode for this week, but it's a really complex episode. There are loads of tricky pronunciations and I just haven't had the time to get it just how I wanted to. So I'm going to put it out when I get back. I also went to an amazing folklore festival in the last couple of days and just been really up against it. And I hate putting out anything if I don't feel 100% about it. But I didn't want to go entirely AWOL. So thought I would put this episode out and let you know, just temporarily, things might be a bit bandy with the timing of the podcast, but I will still aim to get an episode out each week. So please bear with me. I'm not always the best person at juggling. I do try my hardest, but I get a bit overwhelmed. And yeah, today's episode is all about Mother Shipton, one of my favourite witches to talk about. If you are an OG of the podcast, you may have heard me talk about this on a live on Instagram. I'm talking back in the day. Or you might have caught this over on Patreon when I first started out. This recording is from 2020. I never brought it onto the podcast and I don't know why. I went to the Folklore Festival yesterday and they started talking about Mother Shipton. And I thought, oh my goodness, why have we not had this on the podcast So I'm taking you back to old school Carly from 2020, lol. The Mother Shipton story is a few hundred years old, so we are safe on that being up to date. My love of Mother Shipton came from a trip to Knaresborough in Yorkshire. I'm confident that once I move up north, I will definitely be making a trip back to her caves. If you haven't been there before, it is an absolutely amazing place. If you have kiddiewinks, they will love it there too. When I took Emily, my daughter, she was a bit younger and she loved it. Our book review today is Verge by Nadia Atia. And off the bat, need to be quite transparent and say that the lovely publishers of this book sent it to me. I'm lucky that every now and again, I do get sent a few books to review, but I only bring the ones onto the show that I love. I had this book sitting there for a little while ahead of its release date, which was May the 11th. When I started reading it, inhaled it within two days, stayed up till stupid o'clock reading this book because I was so invested in the characters. You hear me say about this a lot, but when it comes to a book... I want to know as much as regarding the characters. I need to know what their essence is, what they look like and so on. I want to be able to picture them fully. And I truly think some authors skip over this aspect. But I want to know, like spare no details, please. I say that as a Charles Dickens lover who literally describes every inkling in regards to a character Not to mention that Charles Dickens comes up with the most amazing names ever, such as Mr. Pumblechook and the like. I digress, but basically, you can never give me too much info on a character. I need their inside leg measurement and everything. This is the book's blurb. In a divided land, the shadow of death draws closer. Rowena has always been a rebel, foul-mouthed, light-fingered, the last to leave a party. Unfortunately, she's also cursed, marked by death since birth. When Rowena's boyfriend and father die in quick succession, 
Her mother sends her north to her gran, the one healer strong enough to lift the curse before her 18th birthday. The fiercely independent Halim is employed to deliver Rowena there safely, but he has problems of his own. Estranged from his wealthy Egyptian family, he's only a few payments away from owning his truck, yet every gun-patrolled hard county border they cross poses a threat to his future, as do Rowena's dark visions. The land has turned treacherous, a disunited kingdom where sinister folk marry old ways with reawakened prejudices. Can Rowena and Halim overcome their differences and forge an alliance in order to survive? I read half of this book in one night alone. I needed it to be prized from my grubby little hands. Such a refreshing book for me to read after a lot of witchy, similar themed books. I really felt I knew Rowena and Halim and the world building was truly amazing. I am a real horror book lover and this book married the old ways with horror so well. There was this ominous undercurrent throughout the book and you couldn't predict the plot if you tried. I think that is why I loved it so much. It is completely different and as a reader you have no idea where it will go. Beautifully written, I really felt a connection to the land through this book and it is the perfect time to read it around spring, beginning of summer. I loved the Beltane scenes and you can tell that the author knows her onions in relation to the Sabbaths and the craft. Rowena is really witchy and has learned a lot from her mother in relation to spells, wards and customs throughout the land. This book is based on the UK but it is ahead of time now and it is reflective to me of how the UK could potentially turn out. This version was a little bit terrifying. The place names the author gives to different regions of the kingdom had me even wondering if they were true places as they were such good names. It definitely stirred a lot of emotion in relation to grief and abandonment and how we deal with that. What I loved about the writer's style is she isn't scared to take risks and do things differently. This book is strange and out there. And for all the cosy witch lit I read, every now and again, I need a book like this to switch things up and send me off on a different traje trajectory. Oh my goodness, why do I even try? Trajectory. I hate playing it too safe with books and just culture in general. And this has left me feeling very inspired to read some other horrors following on from this book. Join me after the break to talk all about Mother Shipton. Shipton was born in a cave along the River Nid on the night of a thunderstorm in summer 1488. Born as an illegitimate child to a young girl, she was named Ursula Somthel, who in her later life married Carpenter Tony Shipton and took his surname. Mother Shipton is England's most famous prophetess. She lived during the reign of King Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I. Her prophetic visions became known throughout England and many prove uncannily accurate even to this day. Since 1641, there have been more than 50 different editions of books about Mother Shipton and her prophecies. Much of her predictions were passed down through word of mouth in a time when most didn't have the ability to read. 
William Caxton only set up his printing works in London 12 years before Ursula was born. So imagine the hunger for stories of prophetesses such as Ursula when her predictions did come to print. To read about this powerful soothsayer and prophetess within these times by candlelight for the educated must have been truly magical. So her story lived on. Some embellishments were made here and there. For example, the story of the young nobleman who came to meet with Mother Shipton to ask if he could foretell his father's death preferably asking if it might be sooner rather than later so that he can inherit his father's money in a bid to escape his creditors. If she could reassure him he wouldn't have to wait for long, he could at least get a little bit more time to pay his creditors. Mother Shipton refused to enlighten him and she said nothing. Following his visit to her, the young man became gravely ill and his own father went on to visit Mother Shipton to ask for reassurance that his son would recover, to which she answered him, Those who gape out for others' death, their own, unlooked for, comes about. Earth he did seek, ere long he shall have, of earth his fill, within his grave. Following that the young man died, Servants of the young man told his father of how his son had visited Mother Shipton himself before his death. Word went around of her power to foretell the future, which she perhaps used to punish the wicked. So due to tales like these, Mother Shipton was held in awe. Even as a young girl, there were rumours that she had powers to avenge unkind remarks that were made by other children towards her in a bid to taunt her. She had an ability to play tricks on the children that were unkind to her and as a result she was named by the children witch or child of the devil. Even as a child she was said to be physically malformed with a crooked spine or hunchback. She was exceptionally intelligent and it is believed she struggled to accept her physical deformities due to her high intelligence. Her mother Agatha was said to be an orphan and reputed as idle and slothful, which suggests or makes reference to her working as a prostitute instead of the hard grind of working in kitchens or in field work. She was said to have been seduced by a handsome charmer who she met one day upon the river bank and he kept her briefly in some form of financial comfort whilst he continued to meet with her. This is said to be the father of Ursula. When Agatha had become pregnant, her neighbours tried to have her arrested for prostitution and she was taken before local justice. Agatha faced her accusers. She was 15 years old and fit to burst within her pregnancy. She was brave within the trial and even went so far as to remind the judge that he was in no position to complain about her, as she happened to know two of his servant girls were with child by him currently. Shortly after, Agatha went into labour in the caves by the River Nid. The caves there are shallow, and close by is an ancient well with waters said to be of mystical powers. Anything that went into the trickling curtain of clear water, be it a shawl, doll or dead bird would turn to stone. Even the leaves of the ivy that trailed in a dark canopy would glisten and whiten and harden as you watched. The night Ursula was born was a hot stifling day in July. The thunder rumbled and fortunately Agatha had a local woman there to help her with childbirth. This woman spoke of smelling sulphur and hearing a great crack of thunder as Ursula entered the world. She also said that the baby jeered and laughed as she was being born and the storm as a result was silenced. During childbirth, it is said that Agatha spoke of the young man she met by the riverside who was father to Ursula and that he had a touch as cold as ice or snow, suggesting there was something not of this world about him. After Ursula's birth, Agatha, her mother, was still supported financially by said young man. Despite her reputation and opposition from locals, she was somehow allowed to baptise Ursula. 
As a baby, Ursula was said to be huge and misshapen. And as she got older, she was said to be bright and mischievous. At the age of two, Agatha put Ursula into foster care. Agatha, her mother, is said to have spent the rest of her life in a convent in Nottingham. So little is known about Ursula's childhood. One of the stories we do know is that she was said to have caused her foster mother a lot of trouble. One day, her foster mother returned home to Ursula following running an errand to find the front door of their home open. Ursula's foster mother feared they had been burgled and called her neighbours to help her enter the house and see what had happened. As they entered, they heard terrifying wailing sounds. They were prevented by some invisible presence or energy from entering the kitchen. A local clergyman happened to be passing the house. He calmed matters down and offered to help them get through the house and to Ursula. He led the way through the house and the group found Ursula's cradle empty. Ursula was only two at the time. They finally located her naked, sitting on an iron bar in the chimney from which the cooking hooks were suspended, but she was smiling happily. It is argued that perhaps the foster mother blamed the devil instead of herself to deflect from the fact she had left a two-year-old alone at home. At the age of 24, Ursula married Toby, a local carpenter. Despite her physical appearance, it is said that the sweetener with Ursula could have been that she did have some money behind her, which might have caused interest but it was also rumoured that she could have created a love powder or charm to help her along the way in finding a partner. Ursula and Toby had no children together. They did live a comfortable life within each other's company. So many predictions were cast by Mother Shipton and many came true. An example is her following statement of prophecy that she remarked whilst her maid rode in a carriage over Trinity Steeple. Before Owlsbridge and Trinity Church meet, what is built in the day shall fall into the night till the highest stone of the church be the lowest stone of the bridge. Not long afterwards, the steeple of York's Trinity Church did indeed fall during a tremendous storm one night. Not only did the steeple crack, but much of the bridge was swept into the river by the flood water. Her reputation for prophecies like this began to spread further afield than Yorkshire. Not long after her marriage, she began to have dealings with great men of the world, even the king himself, Henry VIII. She went on to provide many prophecies that became true relating to Henry VIII and Cardinal Wolsey. Times were difficult in England, taxes were heavy, indiscriminate and demanded and even the poorest felt the effects of this movement. News would be received through word of mouth, often passed on via taverns, servant halls and travellers. People wanted reassurance on the future and would often visit Mother Shipton to find it. Mother Shipton had many a prophecy about Cardinal Wolsey. He heard about her prophecies around his downfall how he would never see the city of York despite being its archbishop. It was making him uneasy, her prophecies, and after many a sleepless night, he sent three of his men to see Mother Shipton to, in essence, silence her. On arriving at Mother Shipton's house, she made the three men welcome. Her maid brought refreshments and she sat them by the log fire. One of the men, Charles, Duke of Suffolk, advised her she wouldn't be so welcoming if she knew what they had arrived for, to which Ursula smiled, poured him another mug of ale and told him, there's no reason why the messenger should be hanged. The Duke explained how her prophecy of Cardinal Wolsey never seeing York was making him uncomfortable, to which she replied he might see York, yet he would never reach it. The Duke responded that Cardinal Wolsey said that once he did finally reach York, he would arrange to have Ursula burnt at the stake, to which Ursula responded, we will see. 
She proceeded to untie her kerchief from around her head and threw it into the fire. The flames licked around the kerchief, but it did not burn. She also took the staff that she used due to her deformity and she put that onto the fire too. Again, this too did not burn. She removed it from the fire and said to the Duke, if this had burned, I might have too. Ursula glanced upon the Duke and said in a bitter voice, my love, the time will come when you will be as low as I am and that's a low one indeed. In his eyes was said to be the fear of witchcraft, which was said to be common within every man of his time. The men then went on to ask Mother Shipton if she could tell them of their future. They felt compelled to ask as they were in her presence. And they were said to have left her home sombre, for she spoke of them being dead upon York pavements. So some time after this meeting, Cardinal Wolsey left London for York. It was a long, dangerous journey. The penultimate destination for them was a village 10 miles to the south of the city called Cawood. They eventually reached Cawood Castle, a medieval tower set into an ordinary street in Cawood. It was said to be the seat of the primates of the northern province of England, not York itself. Cardinal Wolsey, on arriving at Cawood Castle, climbed to the top of the tower to see if he could see York in the clear evening light. On seeing York, he was quick to comment that Mother Shipton said he would never see it. One of his companions corrected him, saying that Mother Shipton said he would see it, but never reach it. Cardinal Wolsey responded that on reaching York, he would have Mother Shipton burned at the stake and he would certainly be there soon. So in a strange turn of events, Cardinal Wolsey was requested to return to London on account of treason. So he had to make the arduous journey back. On reaching Leicester, an existing illness he had became worse. Cardinal Wolsey was nursed, but never regained consciousness and died. Mother Shipton may have been satisfied, but he was grieved for by many. There are a multitude of prophecies that Mother Shipton quoted. She made correct prophecies relating to Edward VI, Lady Jane Grey, Mary Queen of Scots and the Great Plague of London. Many prophecies spanning many future centuries. Mother Shipton died at the beginning of Elizabeth I's reign She's even said to have predicted her own death in 1561. She was buried in unconsecrated ground somewhere on the outskirts of York, following being refused a Christian burial. Her friends and followers gave her a secret resting place that remains a secret to this day. During her lifetime, Mother Shipton's voice was heard in the highest places in the land, sometimes providing a warning sometimes as a kind of commentary throughout dark years of conflict within Britain. Her prophecies have even included planes, cars and telephones. Rumours of her links to the spirit world lasted up to the end. By tradition, a stone was raised on her grave with the following inscription. Here lies she who never lied, whose skill so often has been tried. Her prophecies shall still survive and ever keep her name alive. The stone was said to have been removed at some time to a museum in York, but has now disappeared and its location unknown. That is all I have for you today, witches. I will be back within the week. I will aim to get the episode out that I planned for next weekend. But until then, sending you lots and lots of which you love.